Well, today, uh, I, I want you to know that I am glad that Christmas uh, is, uh, happened yesterday. We, we in celebrated Christmas yesterday. At our house, it was, it was kind of quiet. Uh, anytime Shad's not around, it's quiet. And uh, Shad and his family are down with Rachel's family for a few days. And, and Ben and his family don't get in until later tonight. Uh, so it was a small group of us at our house yesterday, and uh, but no children. I mean, I, it was like we ate in peace, and uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't even understand, but it was such a pleasant thing. But I'll tell you what we did. We probably did the same thing you did. We took out bags of garbage bags full of wrapping paper. Anybody else do that? Now let me tell you, I, I believe that one of the greatest inventions of, uh, of the 20, it probably happened in the 20th century, uh, but I've discovered them in the later stages of my adult life, um, Christmas gift bags. <laughs> Christmas gift bags. I, you, you know what's wonderful about Christmas gift bags? You, you put the gift in the bag. If you really want to fancy it up, get some colored paper and put on top of it. If you want it to be really fancy and your wife bought some, put some paper with glitter on it in there. You might even tie a ribbon around it to kind of keep it closed, or you can do what I do, get out the stapler and staple it all the way across. I didn't really do that, but I actually thought about it. I actually thought about it. But, I mean, what a wonderful thing, a gift bag. Anybody else besides me have trouble getting the folds right at the end of a box? I mean, absolutely. It is the craziest thing. But there's something else wonderful about gift bags. You know what it is? Last year it was my bag. This year it was Jana's bag. <laughs> Next year it's going to be Ava's bag. I mean, it's the gift bag that keeps on giving and giving and giving. Don't look at me like you guys don't do that. You know it is. I mean, we're at our house. We're so penurious that uh, we got we, we've got um, sharpies dedicated to marking out last year's name, so you can't see who the bag was. And if you put a couple little curly cues, it looks like it was a decoration part of the bag anyway. Now, I'm not sure Jana really completely approves of all this, and so because that's true. I actually did better this year than previous years. I wrapped more of her gifts than I put in gift bags. Uh, so, uh, so that's just, that's something that we did. But anyways, I, I hope that uh, we, we've been, during this month of December, uh, we haven't been unwrapping gifts, but we have been unwrapping the gift of Christmas, the real meaning of Christmas. Far too many people unwrap Christmas gifts without really ever unwrapping the gift of Christmas. History tells us that the first celebrations of the birth of Jesus Christ that are recorded are about 300 years after he died. But why were those celebrations happening? Those celebrations were happening because people were remembering to celebrate the birth of the Savior, the incarnation. If you think about it, it's really quite amazing what happened yesterday. All over the world, yesterday, billions of people stopped everything they were doing to celebrate the birth of this son of a carpenter born in a hill country town in the Middle East to a teenage girl and a young man that wasn't even his biological father. Jesus never spoke to more than a few thousand people at one time. He never traveled more or less than 100 miles from home. And yet in the last 24 hours, seven days a week, it has been last week and from this week on, hey, if, Marie, if you'll just hang into a place and get there, I'd stay there with me. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. No, you're good. I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're with your family. Did you have a good Christmas? Good. I'm so glad you did. I'm so glad you did. And I, and I did too, by the way. I, I had good food to eat at Christmas. Did you? Did you have good food to eat at Christmas? Yeah, good, good. Pumpkin pie? 
I had pumpkin pie. It was really good. Y'all excuse us. I haven't seen Marie in a while. Glad to see you again today. What a blessing. Anyways, uh, I was saying that Jesus never spoke to, uh, to a lot of people uh, more than a few thousand at a time. And yet in the last 24 hours, people all over this world have stopped and they have read the words that he said. They have, uh, they have studied the, uh, the, the reasons why he came and they have worshipped him as God. That's why James Merritt wrote this, there is more to the glory of Christmas than just the story of Christmas. There's more to the glory of Christmas than just the story of Christmas. The incarnation, God the Son coming to be born as a baby in Bethlehem, was just the beginning of a round trip that Jesus took from heaven to earth and then back to heaven. That has been our focus these weeks as we have unwrapped this gift of Christmas, the real meaning of Christmas. A few weeks ago, we studied Christmas biology. We learned that Jesus was born of a virgin. He had an earthly mother, but a heavenly father. He's the only child who was ever born without a sinful nature. Thereby, he is the sinless Savior, the Jesus who lived a perfect life. And therefore, he could die for our sins because he had no sins of his own to pay for. What a blessing that is. But then we looked last Sunday at Christmas theology. We learned that Jesus was a human being just like every baby is a human being. But he was also the Son of God unlike any other baby who has been born or ever will be born. Jesus was fully man and is fully God. But that's still not where the story ends. Today we conclude this study with what we're calling Christmas doxology. Christmas doxology. Now, some of you may recognize that word doxology from the hymn book. You, you, you know it? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Boy, I've got that high, don't I? Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, that did have that high. But you've heard that before, right? I mean, that, that's what's called uh, the doxology, the old timers used to call it Old 100th. I think that's because of the place that it was in, in one of the old hymn books. A, a doxology is a term that comes from two Greek words. One word means praise or glory, and the other one uh, means a saying or a word. So a, a doxology is literally a word or an expression of praise and glory. Now, in the Scriptures, Hebrews chapter 13 defines the word praise as the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto His name. That's Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. To understand Christmas doxology then, this morning we're going to turn uh, not to uh, Matthew or Luke, uh, who told us uh, about the shepherds and, and uh, even the wise men who later came to the birth, but rather we're going to look at, at a different New Testament writer, the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul never explicitly talks about the birth of Jesus Christ. In fact, unlike the disciples, the Apostle Paul never saw Jesus physically when Jesus was upon the earth. Now, he did meet Jesus, the risen Christ, on the road to Damascus. And the Apostle Paul, though he never mentions the biology of Christmas, and he doesn't dwell on the theology of Christmas, Paul absolutely records the greatest doxology of Christmas, the greatest word of praise, the expression of praise of Christmas. But Paul shows us the full meaning of what Christmas, likes, uh, Christmas looks like when it is completely unwrapped. Look with me at Philippians chapter 2, and let's begin reading in verse 5. Here's what the Scriptures say. In fact, can we just read this together? Read this with me. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. 
And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, bless us this morning. Bless the reading of your word. And now I pray, Lord, that in this brief time we have together, you would help us to understand the impact of the doxology of Christmas in every one of our lives today in 2021. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Christmas is more than just a season or a day in the year. It's the reason that we should put our focus on Jesus, our faith in Jesus, and proclaim our future with Jesus all year long. Today I want you to see something that most people miss every single year, and that is that Christmas begins with a baby in a cradle, but that's just the beginning of the story. The middle of the story is that the baby in the cradle becomes a Savior on a cross who died and rose again for our sins. But the end of the story is Christmas must always end with a king wearing a crown. In our text, the Apostle Paul shows us three ingredients of Christmas doxology, our expression of praise and glory to God. I want you to look with me at this first ingredient. The first ingredient is this, Jesus identified with us. You ought to be thankful for that. Jesus identified with us. Keep in mind that Paul doesn't give us any details about Jesus' birth. He leaves that to Matthew and Luke. They take us to what happened in Bethlehem. But Paul takes us to what happened before Bethlehem. He takes us behind the curtains of eternity and shows us what took place before Jesus was even born. In verse 5, Paul said, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now there's two things there that jump out immediately. First of all, Jesus was in the form of God. Now that word form refers to a Roman stamp or a seal. Back in those days, an official government document would be sealed with hot wax, and then they would take a a a ring bearing the emperor's uh, insignia, and they would press that into the seal. The impression in the wax would be the exact representation of the insignia that was in the ring. So what Paul is telling us here is that Jesus is the precise, the exact representation of God. In other words, Jesus is exactly God. In fact, that word for equality or he, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, that particular Greek word is the word isos. Uh, an isosceles triangle, by the way, uh, has two equal sides if you remember uh, your geometry. The word isos means equal in size and quality and character. Jesus was equally, he was the isos of God. He is equal With God, he is equally God. But Jesus was also not just equally God, he was eternally God. In every way, Jesus Christ was and is God. He did not cling to that equality uh, when he came to this earth, but he certainly claimed that equality. The point that Paul is making is that when Jesus became a man, he never ceased being God. We talked about that last week. When he became a man, there was no subtraction. He was God in all his fullness. There was no division. He was not part human and part divine. He wasn't a mixture of deity and humanity. He was fully both. When Jesus was born, there was not subtraction. There was not division. But there was addition. He took on human nature. He had never before possessed human nature. God became flesh 
and dwelt among us, John said. Jesus is not just a man among men. He is not first among equals. He's not even the greatest of the great. Jesus Christ is God. You know, if, if somebody back in those days, if Barney Fife would have gotten his fingerprint kit from the state capital of Raleigh and could have found Jesus and taken his fingerprints and sent them off uh, to the FBI laboratory, and they determined that, that they had these fingerprints, that they would have never been able to see those fingerprints before. You know why? Because those fingerprints were the fingerprints of God. But you don't get those from looking at a fingerprint kit. You, all you have to do is look around this world, and you see his fingerprints everywhere. His fingerprints are on lives in this room this morning. His fingerprints are on this world and will forever be. Why? Because He is the Creator. The creation of the world, the parting of the Red Sea, walking on the water, even coming back from the dead. The truth of the matter is the greatest miracle in all of history is that God became man. God became man. Look what He says. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. It says, But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Though he was a king, when he came to this earth, he took the form of a servant. And that really even puzzled his own disciples. They were expecting the Messiah to come as a conquering, reigning, honored king. They didn't even consider that he would come as a man. They were expecting him to be born into royalty and be surrounded by servants, not be a servant. But instead, the Bible says, he took upon him the form of a servant. He lived like a slave. Remember, slaves owned nothing. In fact, if you go back and think about it, Jesus borrowed everything. He borrowed a place to be born. He said, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. He, he had to borrow a place to sleep. He borrowed a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. He borrowed a donkey to ride into town. He borrowed a room to have the Lord suffer. He even borrowed a tomb. There's a song that I really like that says, he only needed it for the weekend. He was born in the likeness of man. That word likeness there is a word that means to be exactly what it appears to be. Jesus was not a clone. He was not God in disguise. He was not just a facsimile of a human being. He was a real flesh and blood man just like you and me. And what's so unique to Christianity is not just the belief that Jesus was God, but that in Jesus, God had become a human being. Now, every other religion in this world expects their God to be just that, to be a God. That God would become not just a human being, but the lowest of human being, beings. That is seen by every other religion as simply not God-like. There's no other faith in history besides Christianity that has ever considered being human essential to its faith in God. But that's exactly why we celebrate Christmas. Christ, God, the Creator God, God the Son, became man. But the Christmas birth begs the question, if Jesus was God, why did he die, identify with us? Why would the Son of God leave the glory of heaven to come to earth as the Son of Man? Why would he leave his, his throne in heaven uh, to come to earth as a servant? Why would he leave a place where he is exalted to come to a place where he would be executed? Well, the answer to that is the second ingredient to the Christmas doxology. Here it is. Jesus was crucified for us. Jesus was crucified for us. We ought to be thankful about that. Are you thankful this morning? He was crucified for us. Jesus was God who became an infant. 
He went to the lowest, the lowest he could possibly go. Look at verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He humbled himself. He went from sitting on a throne to laying in a manger to hanging on a tree. He went from being a king with a crown to a baby with diapers to a criminal in the eyes of the world on a cross. Why? Because your soul was more important to him than his blood. Because your eternal life was more important to him than his earthly life. Because your place in heaven was more important to him than his place in heaven. He gave up his place so that you could have a place with him for all of eternity. What an amazing thing. Are you thankful? Are you thankful this morning? In other words, the one who had the right to demand his rights gave up his rights for us. He didn't play the God card. He humbled himself by obeying to the point of death. God the Father didn't force the death of God the Son. He didn't coerce Jesus to die. It was the Father's will that he died, but it was the Son's decision to carry out the Father's will. He never called him to die nor compelled him to die. Jesus, the Son of God, and God the Son chose to die, and he chose to die for you and for me. Are you thankful? Are you thankful? You see, the problem is you can't separate the birth of Jesus from the death of Jesus. Without the incarnation, the crucifixion would have been meaningless, and the resurrection would have never happened. God became a human being, not just to live with us, but to die for us. It was as a man Jesus died, but it was as God that he died for us. The cradle without the cross is incomplete. The cross without the cradle is ineffective. Paul makes sure we understand he didn't just die. But I want you to see there at the end of verse 8, that rather he died the death of the cross. One of our missionaries, Boyd Lyons, longtime missionary in the Philippines, dear friend to so many, pastor, uh, the father of Pastor Eddie Lyons over at High Street Baptist Church. Boyd was at home uh, with his family in a soft bed and passed away and went from this life to the next life on Christmas Eve. Be praying for Pastor Eddie and and his brother Greg and their family, if you would please. Jesus didn't have a soft bed surrounded by friends and family. Jesus died the worst form of a criminal death you could imagine. To this day, some have speculated the crucifixion is still the most cruel, excruciatingly painful, shameful form of execution that's ever been conceived by humanity. It was such a low form of death that it was reserved for slaves and the worst kind of criminals. As a Roman citizen, you couldn't be crucified no matter how awful the crime they committed. That's what makes the cross so amazing. Think about it. Before he ever created this world, before God, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He was at the top of the, the rung of everything. Jesus was at the pinnacle of the organizational chart of the universe. He was God. But at the end of his earthly life, he wasn't just a servant. He was a savior dying on a cross. He never pulled rank. He never asked to be first in line. He never demanded his rights. He never leveraged who he was. He used his power for the good of others and the glory of God. Are you thankful? Are you thankful for that this morning? This is when you really begin to unwrap the gift of Christmas. 
when you realize that Christmas is not just what Jesus did for us, but what we are also to do for him. The way he lived his life is the way we should live our lives. That's why Paul began this entire passage with this verse saying, in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus spent his entire life doing two things, obeying God and serving others. And so should we. We're not God, but we can be gracious We're not heavenly, but we can be humble. We're not sovereigns, but we can be servants. If we fully unwrap the gift of Christmas, then we'll begin to sing the Christmas doxology. And when you do, you'll want to think the way Jesus thought and live the way Jesus lived. That's why we should be thankful that Jesus came and was crucified for you and me. I'll ask you again this morning, are you thankful? Are you thankful? Let me give you the final ingredient of Christmas doxology this morning. Jesus is magnified over us. And once again, we need to be thankful. He's magnified over us. It's great that we celebrate the baby in the manger. We ought to be thankful for that Savior who died on the cross. We ought to celebrate that Jesus came back from the dead But if we're fully going to unwrap the gift of Christmas, you can't leave Jesus in a cradle, on a cross, or in a cave. You have to get him off of one, out of the other. But here is a final ingredient. You have to put him on a throne. That's why Paul climaxes everything about Jesus in verse 9 where he says, Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now that word wherefore is very important. He's saying that in the light of the fact that Jesus was willing to to humble himself down to the lowest, he will wind up elevated and exalted as the highest. God has given Jesus the name which is above every name. Now I, I, I want you to look with this and stay with me on this. You may not necessarily agree with me. This is not a point of theology But I want you to look at something. What is the name? What is the name? What is the name? I don't think it's the name Jesus. There were other people named Jesus in that time. It was a very common name in that day. The name that Jesus has been given is seen in verse 11, where he will be confessed as what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is his earthly name. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He wasn't called Jesus before then. Jesus was his earthly name. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. We saw it last week. For he shall save his people from their sins. He is our Redeemer as Jesus. But as Lord, he is our ruler. Jesus was born human so he could could relate to us. He died as a savior so he could redeem us. He was raised as Lord to rule over us. And this is how the entire world is going to respond to him. Uh, Look at verse 10. It says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. Now, when you bow, you're surrendering. When you uh, want to honor someone and exalt someone, elevate someone, lift someone up, you bow before them. Paul doesn't mince any words here, by the way. Look what he says again in verse 10. He says, every knee is going to bow. By choice or by force, every knee is going to bow. Every knee is... Above us in heaven, whether it be angels or humans, every knee around us, whether it be believer or unbeliever, every knee under us, the devil, every demon is going to bow and surrender to the Lord Je- Lordship of Jesus Christ. And it won't be done silently. Look at verse 12. Not only will every knee bow, but every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue means every atheist tongue. 
It means every agnostic tongue. It means every angelic tongue, every demonic tongue, every human tongue is going to confess four words. Jesus Christ is Lord. And at that moment, the round trip of Christmas will be complete. That baby that was crying in a cradle, that man that was dying on a cross, that Savior who rose again the third day will be back where he has always been in eternity past and where he will always be in eternity future. He will be reigning on a throne in heaven because he is Lord. And it's all going to be done to the glory of God the Father. The purpose of the universe the purpose of all history, the purpose of your life and mine is to bring glory to God. And when we fully unwrap the gift of Christmas, you're going to understand Christmas is not primarily about giving Christmas gifts to each other. Christmas is ultimately about giving God the praise and glory that He deserves because of the gift of Christmas that He has given to us. Are you thankful this morning? Are you thankful? Now, it's really interesting to note, by the way, that there are no recorded births in Scripture after the birth of Jesus. The last genealogy listed in the New Testament is that of Jesus. Why? Because the, the entire biblical record has pointed to the birth of the baby that was born to God coming in the flesh to save us all. That's what it all pointed to. Everyone and everything was getting ready for God's gift of Christmas. God became one of us so that we could be with Him forever and ever. Are you thankful this morning? Are you thankful? He became one of us. He deserves all the glory and all the praise. Let me end with a story that James Merritt recorded that was told by the, a plastic surgeon named Maxwell Maltz. He told about a man who had been injured attempting to save his parents in a burning house. Sadly, his parents died in the flames and this man's face was burned and he was permanently disfigured. Somehow this man had the idea that this was God's punishment on him because he couldn't save his parents. And he wouldn't let anyone see him. He was so, so badly burned and so permanently disfigured, he wouldn't let anyone see him. He... he just com stayed completely away from everybody, including his wife. One day she went in to see this plastic surgeon, this renowned surgeon, Dr. Maltz, to ask him for help. He knew about the case, and he said to the woman, I think I can restore his face to where he'd be willing to see other people. Well, she knew that wouldn't help because the husband would refuse any help. He already had. And she refused the doctor's offer flat out right then. He said, then why did you come to see me? And she said this, I want you to disfigure my face so that I can be like him. If I can look like him and hurt like him, maybe he will let me back into his life. Of course, Dr. Maltz was shocked and of course, he denied her request. But he was so moved by the story and by this woman's love that he asked if he could go and see her husband. He got to the place, he knocked at the door, and the man refused to open it. Dr. Maltz said, I, I know, Sir, I know you're in there. I, I'm a plastic surgeon and I know that I can restore your face there was no response at all 
He said, please come out. Still no response at all. Still speaking through the door, Dr. Maltz told the man what his wife had done. Sir, she wants me to disfigure her face and make her face like yours so that you will let her back into your life. That's how much she loves you. And after a brief moment, in total silence, the man opened the door. That woman and the way that she loved her husband is only a fraction of how much God loves us. He took on our disfigurement. He became flesh. He became like us. He suffered like us. He died like us and for us so that we could be like Him and with Him forever and ever. Are you thankful? Are you thankful this morning? That is Christmas doxology. When you offer Him your praise for what He has done for you. That is Christmas doxology. Would you bow your heads with me today?